Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains in Missouri, USA. For months now, I've had this crazy idea about turning a Commodore 64 into a CNC machine controller. Now, why would I want to do that? Well, my day job involves building automated machinery sometimes for research purposes for a university. And I run a small company on the side that sells desktop sized and slightly larger CNC equipment online. And this seemed like a fun opportunity to combine two of my interests, that being CNC and vintage computers. It seemed like the beginning of a new year was the time to start a new long-term project like this. This will be the first of several episodes where we create a working CNC controller from a Commodore 64. In this episode, we'll cover creating a non-maskable interrupt handler to generate step pulses, as well as a nifty little circuit that lets us double the step rate that we'd normally be able to get out of a Commodore 64. So, let's get started. One of the first things that occurred to me is that the pulsing engine should run in an interrupt and it seemed like the non-maskable interrupt would be the way to go so it takes precedence over everything else. So then I set off trying to figure out how to use that because it had been many years since I tried to do that. So after a lot of reading and reading about the CIAs and reading between the lines, etc., I finally got something to work and uh, that's what we're looking at now in CBM Program Studio. So this first part right here is just the basic loader. So when you load the program, it'll automatically run. That's something that uh, CBM Studio will create for us. And we've got a couple constants. And these are just the pins on the user port, port B, uh, that the X step and Y step will be on. So we have... Uh, pin 1 and pin 3. And the first thing we do, the first part that runs, it just sets up the timer B in the uh, CIA2, which is connected to the user port. I believe that's CIA2. Anyhow, uh, we disable interrupt, so while we're setting the interrupt up, we're not interrupted. And we save some of the current state by pushing it to the stack. And then we take the address of our um, interrupt routine and we push that to the interrupt vector locations. So when the interrupt occurs, it'll call our code, not the pre-existing kernel code. Then we have to go in and set up the timer. So basically we're setting it to generate the NMI when the timer underflows. And uh, we're clearing all the lines on the data port while we're at it. And we're setting all the lines to outputs for now, just for our testing. And then right here at DD06 and DD07, we're setting that to 03E8, which is 1000 in decimal, which means that at about one kilohertz, our uh, timer will underflow and the interrupt will be generated and our code will be called. And this part down here I found that you have to uh, store the setting and then read it again which resets it which seems kind of weird but that's how it works. Then we're pulling our state back off the stack, re enabling interrupts and we're done. So when this code runs it's just going to do the setup and that's it. And we just have a byte of storage here before we get to our actual um, interrupt handler. And when the interrupt handler is entered, it uh, disables interrupts, saves the state kind of like we did before. And we clear the existing interrupt, that way it'll fire again. And we load the X step pin designation and or that with Y step and then we exclusive or that with our port B mask which is our variable up here and what that does or what the effect of that is is it just toggles those two pins so each time the interrupt is called it toggles the state of the pins 
So after we uh, exclusive or that, we store it back to the port mask so we know what it is for next time. Then we store it to the port B outputs. And this part right here, uh, storing the same value to 0400, that just is saving that value to the top left corner of the screen so we get some sort of visual indication. And uh, this is doing the same thing with whatever happens to be in uh, memory location in hex is COO, which is 49152. And the reason I did that, this is the first thing I did just to check and make sure the uh, interrupt routine was working. And then I added in this section here to 0400 to output to the screen note it was outputting to the uh, user port. That way I could see it was doing something in the emulator before I tried it on real hardware. So after we're done toggling everything and saving everything and updating the screen to give us a visual indication that it's working, we pull our state back off the stack, clear the interrupt, and then we'll return from our interrupt. We're all done. And this little bit of code is going to be called about a thousand times a second. So now we'll go ahead and run this in Vice. Here we go. Okay, so it automatically did a run when it was loaded. It's done the setup for us. And then what I need right here is this. So I will copy that. I'll go over here to device and I'll paste it in just so I don't have to type it. And setting this, this Pope 56 591 to one starts the timer, which in turn, when the timer underflows, then it'll call our interrupt. I hit enter there and you see up in this corner of the screen we have a couple characters that are fluctuating back and forth here that is what's being output to port B in this at this was just something I did um, that's where it's reading the value from 49152 that was one of the first things I did to get a visual indication interrupt, interrupt was running I could go poke 49152 comma say 1 and it'll change that to an A. So this just let me know in a very easy way that my interrupt code was running. Now we can try that on the actual hardware and see how it works. Okay, I am doing a combination of handheld and fixed recording at the same time. So we'll see how this works. So I have the 64C set up that we cleaned up in the last video. And you can also see the screen there, which is being recorded on a separate camera. because I don't have a capture card set up for that yet. And here is an SD to IEC to load the program from. We see we have a um, oscilloscope probe set up here, which is going this connector on the user port so we're going to be monitoring our output and here is the oscilloscope now right now it's at 5 volts because that is the default state of the port and if I can type one-handed we will load the file browser Oops, try that again. Ah, there we go. Okay. And we will run the file browser. Okay, and we'll go down to our C64 directory and to our pulsing program right there. And when this loads in, it's going to do like it did on the simulator. It's going to set up the, the interrupt and the CAA and then it'll just stop. So I'm going to focus here again on 
the oscilloscope so we can see now it's high this program runs and it drops low so it's reset the port set all the the pins to outputs and set them all low now remember in order to start the timer we had to do a get you back out here a little bit see if I can type one handed again poke five six five nine one comma one which is going to start the timer I get you back up here on the oscilloscope Ta and there we have square wave so let me see if I, I'm probably blocking the screenshot a little bit but I will try to zoom in here some Okay, you notice there's a little jitter, so um, there's going to be a little variation as to exactly when the interrupt is being called because it has to finish the other stuff it's doing, you know, the current instruction it's running before it can service the interrupt. And if we look in this corner, let's see if I can zoom in more on that so you can read it. It says it's about 511 Hertz. Now if you remember, we had a 1 kilohertz uh, update on our interrupt. It's being called a thousand times a second, yet uh, we only have a 511 Hertz square wave here. Why is that? Well, uh, each time the interrupt calls, it is changing the state of the output, high to low, high to low, high to low, etc. And you have to have a full cycle there. So in other words, if we're generating a step pulse here, we have to set it high and then set it low. Uh, so whatever uh, rate that we're calling our interrupt at, we're actually going to get half of that frequency output at a maximum, which is less than ideal for our purposes because we don't have a lot of extra horsepower. Uh, on the Commodore to do this stuff. Now if we look uh, at the screen of the Commodore 64 we can see on the top left hand corner we have a fluctuating character which is just the data we're outputting to the user board. We're also outputting to the screen and we can see it changing so we know that we are indeed toggling it. Now, if you remember the first test I did I just copied what was in uh, C000 or 49152 to the second position on the screen. So I'm poking an A in there and oops I used the wrong value and I'll type that in again. I'll poke an A in there and there we go. So we know that our non-maskable interrupt routine works and we can also get a screen display while that's busy pulsing the output in the background for us. Now we have our non-maskable interrupt pulsing routine working and uh, we found out that even though we're calling the NMI routine at 1 kilohertz we're only getting a 500 kilohertz square wave out because on one call we set it high and the next call we set it low to get a complete wave. And this kind of disappointed me, even though it made perfect sense, uh, because it really limited the output speed or the stepping pulse speed that I'd be able to get. And then I got to thinking about the first little CNC machine that I converted to run on Mach 3. That was a Dyna 2400 mil, and it had the curious property that the original stepper drives were made to step on both edges of the step pulse. And since it was, you know, made in the 80s and, you know, the uh, competing horsepower wasn't as good then, I figured that was just a way for them to get more step pulses with a lower frequency. And then it occurred to me I could do the same thing here. I could just toggle the pin when I needed a step and it didn't matter if it was going high or low, I could have that trigger a step pulse generator. So that's what this circuit does. So here we have the user port, or just a simple representation of it, and uh, the pin numbers aren't correct, by the way. Here's the correct 
pin numbers on the port over here to the left. At any rate, we have our X step line, our X direction line, Y step and Y direction. Uh, they're just the same thing. And if we go up and look at this circuit right here, the direction line just goes through an OR gate just as a buffer because we had a couple extra OR gates. And the step line for X goes through a 74LS123, which is a dual uh, monostable multivibrator chip, which basically just means uh, it's a timing chip, sort of like a simple version of a 555 timer. Uh, since there's two separate timers in here, I have one set up to trigger on the rising edge of a pulse and the other set up to trigger on a falling edge of a pulse. And with this resistor capacitor combination, we get about a 20 microsecond output pulse uh, for each transition on the input wave, which works out pretty good. So we take these two outputs, one pulse from the rising edge, one pulse from the falling edge, and we feed them through an OR gate. So we get one single output, so a pulse for each edge condition which goes uh, then to where our stepper drive will eventually be. I whip this up onto a little breadboard and we'll take a look at that next kind of uh, setup with a signal generator and the oscilloscope and we'll see how that works. Here is a close-up of our circuit. Here we have one of the 74 LS123s and then our 7432 OR gate and the other 74LS123. Two of the capacitors are the timing capacitors and I didn't have any 4.7K resistors so I just put a couple 10Ks in parallel and the other few capacitors on there are just bypass capacitors. Here we have a wider shot of the board. Here on the right we have channel 2 on the oscilloscope which is measuring the output of the OR gate. On the left, we have channel one on the oscilloscope, which is the input from the function generator. And this kind of sad setup you see uh, with the BNC connector and the adapter and just wires wrapped around it, that's because I couldn't find the correct adapter. The first part of our test setup for this circuit is just the bench power supply. It's outputting five volt and our little circuit's drawn about 23 milliamps. The next step in our test setup is a function generator. And this is not a very expensive or good one, but it was inexpensive and it works. It's outputting about one kilohertz. And I'm just using the TTL output, so it's outputting a square wave. It doesn't matter what I have the function set to over here. I just get a square wave. And finally, we're at the oscilloscope. This bottom yellow trace is the output of the function generator which the scope says is about one kilohertz, which agrees with the function generator setting, which is also what we had our test in a my program set to. And this top blue trace here is the output of our circuit. And from the falling edge, we have a pulse. And also from the rising edge, we have a pulse. So now we've in effect doubled our output frequency and we can control the number of pulses, but we just need to toggle the state of that output pin on the Commodore 64 anytime that we need to step. Okay, now we've combined the setups from our last two uh, video clips. We've got our 64C, the user port cable, and instead of going directly to the oscilloscope now, we're going through the edge detecting pulse board that we just looked at. We have two oscilloscope probes hooked up. The yellow one, which is the bottom trace here on channel one, that is the input signal from the user port. And the kind of bluish, purplish looking one, the top trace, channel two, is the output from our edge detecting pulse port. And you can see the screen in the other shot. Now we'll kind of do what we did before. See if I can type it in right the first time. We're going to load the file browser. Oops. And you notice that just like before the input signal from the uh, 
the user port to our pulse board is high and the output of the pulse board is low. Now we will run the file browser go to the C64 directory and we'll see after it sets everything up our output from the user port goes low and we'll do our poke 56591,1 and what we should see here on the oscilloscope if I can zoom in a little bit is our bottom is our square wave which is still about 511 Hertz but now we're getting a about a 20 microsecond pulse off each edge of that so each time our code toggles the state of the user port we can get a pulse out for a step which means that we can pulse our uh, or drive the stepper motor about twice as fast as we would normally be able to uh, having to set and reset the output signal uh, from our interrupt code so this is a big benefit in this episode we covered creating a non-maskable interrupt handler to generate step pulses from the Commodore 64 user port. We also built a little edge detecting pulse generation circuit that allows to double a step rate that we'd normally be able to achieve from a Commodore 64. 64. Okay. We'll also go over the buffering code needed to handle the parse data and make sure we always have step pulse data available for our MMI pulse engine. Oh, one more thing please consider subscribing. If you look down below, you'll see a subscribe button. Just click on that guy and there's also a bell-shaped icon. Click on that bell icon and you'll be notified the next time I post a video. I sure would appreciate it. Thanks. Bye now.